All right, guys, here's everything else you need for the, uh, for the presentation. Uh, the last part is Vatican II. Remember, the, uh, we're for the review. Uh, the last part of the review is on Vatican II. Remember, we're covering the Council of Trent. We're also covering um, the notes on the sacraments, which are pretty self-explanatory. And here's a review of the Vatican II presentations with all the key information. Um, you need to know that Vatican II was started in 1962 and lasted for three years. Um, the idea behind Vatican II was to, in, for the church to engage the modern world. Uh, you know, the feeling was that the church had really become disengaged with the modern world. Uh, the mass was still said in Latin, um, and there was not really, there was not an emphasis on involving the laity, including the laity, um, or even evangelizing the laity. It was kind of like, just show up and shut up was more of the attitude, uh, at least in certain parts of the world in the Catholic Church. Um, and again, there was a lot of confusion uh, about what Catholics believe and what it means to be a Catholic, similar to what happened before the Council of Trent. So here you have the Catholic Church again trying to educate uh, and involve the laity um, and try to inform uh, the church. Um, so there aren't a lot of new dogmas, but there's a lot of new disciplines in the way the church uh, teaches and acts. Okay, so just to give you some of the basic information here, um, you should know that at Vatican II, a key thing is that um, it wasn't just about modernizing the church for the sake of Catholics. There was also this desire to engage people of, uh, of other Christian denominations and to engage other religions. And so non-Catholics were actually invited to Vatican II. Um, and there was a real keen interest on, on inviting Protestants and letting them see what the church thinks, understand why the church thinks this way, and also to let them have an input um, and perspective on, on the Catholic Church uh, so we could live in a better relationship with our non-Catholic Christian uh, brothers and sisters. So that's important to understand that. Um, some of the key terms you need to know. Uh, unction in extremis is extreme unction. That's anointing of the sick. You should know what the diaconate is. Um, the diaconate uh, became a permanent diaconate for uh, married people. So it was the first time you could have married deacons. Um, well, actually, it's not the first time the church went back to that teaching and allowed married deacons, and so now you have married members of the church performing some of the sacraments uh, and being more involved with the liturgy at the Mass, even giving the homily at Mass, which was a radical shift uh, from a church that was speaking exclusively in Latin with celibate priests. Um, you also uh, need to know what the episcopate is. That's a bishop, and a presbyter is a priest. Okay, the primal sacrament uh, is Jesus. Jesus is the original sacrament. That's really from Karl Rahner and some of the other theologians just before Vatican II. Uh, you find that Rahner and, and um, some of these other theologians really impacted Vatican II's thinking. Um, the church is also considered a sacrament. So Christ is the primal sacrament of God. He makes the invisible God visible. So he's the sacrament of God. And now the church is the sacrament of Christ. The church makes the invisible Christ visible in our world today. Um, and then obviously there are the seven sacraments within the church that make the invisible love or grace of God uh, visible and experienceable. Uh, something that can be experiential. Uh, is it preferred to practice the faith in community? Yes. Uh, community is emphasized over solitude um, and that because we really are the body of Christ together. Uh, the first sacrament uh, is the Eucharist. The, what is the shape of that sacrament? The Mass is the shape, that there's this, this gathering uh, where we come together and then we share uh, stories, we share the Gospels and the Old Testament writings. Then there's a breaking of the bread, a meal sharing, which is the Eucharist, and then a dismissal. Uh, and the word Mass comes from the word uh, Misa, which means to send forth. Um, so that you have the dismissal at the end of Mass. Um, Okay, the first sacrament is the Eucharist. So the, that's like the first sacrament, the highest um, ranking sacrament, if you will, is the Eucharist. Okay, um, what does baptism now acknowledge after Vatican II? It acknowledges the importance of the parent's role in raising their child uh, in the Catholic faith. Uh, the domestic church, or the family church, is the primary church. So the most important place that I'm holy as a Catholic is not in the classroom, it's not as a youth minister. It's not even as a Eucharistic minister at Mass. Uh, the most important place for me to be holy is at home with my wife and kids. Uh, and I'll tell you, that's 
one of the hardest places to be holy. Um, it's one of the hardest places to be church, is with uh, the people we live with. And yet, according to the church, that is the most important place to be holy. That's the domestic church. And so the parents' role uh, in, in baptism is, is acknowledged and emphasized. Um, and it's preferred that the baptism be done publicly, because it's really supposed to be a welcoming a person into the whole community. In fact, all the sacraments are preferred publicly, uh, including marriage, etc. Um, the RCIA is how adults convert to the church, um, established at Vatican II, so there's some more organization in the church. Um, we're going to skip question five. We're going to go to question uh, six. How has extreme unction changed? Uh, now it's called anointing of the sick, and it can be celebrated more than once in your life. Um, it used to be celebrated at the moment of your death, uh, but it, it was a more biblical concept to return to anointing people who are sick. It says it in James chapter 5, uh, that, the, that the, the priests, the presbyters, went and anointed the sick and prayed for their healing and prayed for the forgiveness of their sins, which is what the sacrament is. Um, how has the sacrament of marriage changed? It's more of a covenant now. Uh, instead of a contract, the, the covenant aspect is, um, is emphasized, and it's really a template for our relationship with God, because uh, the church is the bride of Christ, and so marriage is actually uh, a metaphor or, uh, or a template for understanding God. At um, Vatican II, they really emphasized not just the procreative aspect of marriage, but also the unitive aspect, that uh, it's supposed to bring two people closer together in love, and that was something that was forgotten or maybe under-acknowledged. Um, under How has holy orders changed? Uh, you have a married diaconate for the first time in a long time. So you have married members of the uh, clergy, um, and they're in the line of, um, of succession, of apostolic succession now. Uh, how has the relationship between the laity and the priesthood changed? The laity now has leadership roles. Um, the priests work with the laity. Um, the laity don't just show up at mass and act as spectators. Um, they don't just show up at church events and act as spectators. Now the laity are encouraged to be leaders. Um, you're looking at it in action. You have a layperson right now teaching you theology. Uh, at St. Vincent de Paul, I'm a layperson who's a youth minister. And so you now have a, an active laity uh, who takes an active role in leadership within the church. Um, and that's something that's going to continue to grow. And it's something that the church is going to have to um, continue to grow into. Um, as while also celebrating the unique role of priests and, uh, and the unique role that they have within the community. Uh, especially with regard to the sacraments. Um, how is the church, has the church now reached the fullness of divine truth? Okay. Um, in relationship to God, the church has the fullness of divine truth because Jesus Christ is the fullness of God's divine truth, um, and he's revealed himself to us, and, and we honor Jesus Christ. So yes, the church has the fullness of di divine truth when it comes to God, but when it comes to its application to mankind, uh, that's always evolving and always changing. And so we're always reaching for that fullness of divine truth as it relates to us as people. Um, so in theory, when it just comes to God, it's not going to change. God is God. The scriptures don't change. Uh, the church isn't going to change its teachings on God. Um, it's not going to rewrite the Bible. But as we apply those teachings to humanity, and in, to an ever-changing and evolving humanity, um, the church's relationship and the church's teachings, how they relate to humanity, do change over time. Uh, and you've seen that uh, countless ways in the ways the sacraments have changed as we've gone over before. We still have the sacraments, um, but they have evolved in their usage and application. Uh, and we always will have the seven sacraments. Okay, um, then the, the presenters for Vatican II needed to read Sacrosanctum Concilium. Um, Sacrosanctum just means liturgy or sacred liturgy. And then concilium is just constitution. So it's the constitution uh, for sacred liturgy, um, just like we have the constitution of the United States. Um, so it explains how sacred liturgy is supposed to operate. Um, and then there are some other terms here that we've gone over in class. Hopefully you have those definitions. So let's just review the key questions. Um, what are the four aims of sacrosanctum concilium? Number one, to encourage everyone to be involved. So to encourage the involvement of all Catholics in liturgy, uh, that we don't observe as spectators, that we all get involved as laity and obviously as priests. Um, number two, to simplify the liturgy, 
to make it more understandable, to bring it down to earth. So to, number two, to simplify the liturgy. Number three, to create unity. Um, so you simplify the liturgy and you try to create unity within the Catholic Church, but also in the Church's relationship to other Christian churches. Uh, having Mass in Latin did not create unity with other Christian churches that d did not use Latin and couldn't understand Latin. And it didn't create unity within the Catholic Church because most Catholics didn't know Latin uh, themselves. They simply knew the Latin responses. Um, they had simply memorized them, but uh, they, could not, they were not conversant in Latin. So, number one, encourage all involvement of all the church members. Number two, to simplify the liturgy. Number three, to create unity. And then number four was to evangelize, uh, to use the liturgy as a form of evangelization. Uh, that was the purpose. Those were the four purposes of this document, Sacrosanctum Concilium. Uh, who's the person who really baptizes and performs all sacraments? It's Jesus. The priest is not saving anybody. Jesus Christ is saving people uh, through grace, through the sacraments. Grace saves us. It's offered in the sacraments, but it's offered by Jesus Christ. The priest is an intermediary. He's acting uh, in persona Christi, is the Latin phrase for this Catholic belief, that the priest is standing there in the person of Christ. It's not the priest's holiness that saves you. It's not his ability to forgive sins that forgives you in confession. It's God's ability to forgive sins. And he is simply helping you pray your way to God, uh, basically, um, with a rite and a sacrament instituted by Christ in John chapter 20. Um, so he simply helps you in your relationship to God. So what does that mean for priests? They're intermediaries. What does it mean for lay people? Um, we should speak directly to God. At confession, when I go to confession... I'm talking to Jesus Christ. I'm telling Jesus Christ my sins. Father Chung could be the person hearing my confession. He, he's listening, and he has the apostolic uh, right. He has the right from the apostles to confer forgiveness on me, but that comes from Jesus Christ. So it just helps me to pray. helps me in my relationship with God. Um, and, I, and I'm very grateful for it because it makes that invisible love tangible, experienceable, especially when you're dealing with sin. It, it's important. Um, the disposition of the person receiving the sacraments does definitely have an effect on the effectiveness of the sacraments. Grace is always effective. doesn't matter if the priest is holy or not. doesn't matter if you are holy or not. Grace is always God's unconditional love. God's unconditional love never changes. It's always effective. It's always there for you. But how much of an impact that can have on you personally depends on how much you're willing to let that in. You could go to Mass your whole life, go through the motions, reject God's love every day, and I suppose not even go to heaven. Um, you have to have that personal relationship with God. Uh, that disposition matters. And so therefore priests and people leading the liturgy, even lay people assisting in the liturgy, need to understand that it is their job to help motivate people to have a better disposition uh, for this sacrament. Um, so at Mass, I speak before the youth Mass. Uh, my job is to help dispose people to that grace that's available in the sacrament of the Eucharist. My job is not to give the grace. That's uh, that's offered uh, through the priest in the sacraments. Um, but, you know, it's not uh, my job is to help dispose people by giving a talk to introduce the Mass um, before the Mass begins and to introduce the youth group and everything. Um, the Vatican II wanted to simplify the rites of the Catholic Church. Vatican II wanted to help us adapt the rites of the Catholic Church to the local cultures and customs. So we want to be sensitive to those customs. So in Africa, um, the Mass does feel very different than in America because you have a lot of African-style music. You have African dancing during the liturgy. Um, people are bringing goats and sheep instead of putting coins in a basket. Uh, it's a very different thing, and the Church wants to embrace cultures. It does not want to reject culture or create what's called a monolithic uh, culture. It's, it's, we want a diverse culture within our Church. Um, and as lay people, we should understand that and bring that culture to our church. Um, should lay people be silent spectators? No. The Mass should be more simplified, according to Vatican II. Um, the Bible should be emphasized more. Vatican II said Catholics need to read the Bible, and we do. Uh, that's something that we've lost, and our Protestant brothers and sisters understand thoroughly. And the really sad thing is that all of our teachings come from the Bible. The real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist is in the Bible. Confession is in the Bible. Um, and we assume it's not because Protestants don't, some Protestants don't believe in those things. And then we know they read the Bible, so we assume what we believe is not in the Bible. And it's just, it's just foolish and sad. Um, as you do know, however, there are Protestant churches that do embrace confession, the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Um, 
and some of these more traditional Catholic ideas, the Orthodox Church embraces the real presence of Jesus in confession. The Lutheran Church does the same, and so does the Anglican Church. You do want to know that for this test. Uh, the mother tongue is the vernacular, um, and so the Mass can be said now in the mother tongue of a country. Uh, so in America, the vernacular in America in most communities is English, and so the Mass can be said in English or the mother tongue. Um, does the Church prefer us to take part in just the Liturgy of the Word? or the Liturgy of the Word and the Eucharist. Uh, we are supposed to take part in both. If you're going to err um, on whether re to receive the Eucharist or not at Mass, the Church wants you to err on receiving the Eucharist and to make every effort to be disposed to receive the Eucharist. The Church wants you to be fully involved uh, in the Mass. Um, the sacraments impart grace. That means they offer God's love. God's love is put there for you to have and receive and accept in your life if you want it. Um, but the sacraments also are supposed to help dispose us to receive that grace uh, or inspire us. So when a priest is saying the Mass, it's not his job just to go through the motions and offer God's love with, you know, with, the, with the proper format of the Mass or something like that. It's also, he's also supposed to, supposed to dispose us or inspire us to accept that love and that grace. Um, we all have to be aware of that as Catholics. Um, and can the Divine Office be prayed in vernacular? Yes. Uh, who is the ordinary who decides that? The bishop. Um, I, I think that's it. If you understand the content in this presentation and the previous presentation and you've studied the notes on the sacraments, you should be in a, in a good place. Um, some of the key things from the notes in the sacraments that we didn't go through, again, um, Lutherans, Anglicans, and the Orthodox celebrate the sacraments in almost an identical manner to how we celebrate them. Um, ecumenism, be sure you know the definition of that, be sure you understand limbo uh, and the church's perspective on that. Um, be sure you know that, um, let's see, that you are not rebaptized if you convert to Catholicism from like another Christian church, you are not remarried. In fact, the church even honors holy orders in the Anglican church. Um, so the person would be a priest if he converted to Catholicism. He'd probably have to be trained with a couple things, but he would be accepted as a priest without being re-consecrated um, in holy orders. It's also important to know that Jesus Christ said that the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. So that means these sacraments are not supposed to be obligations. The Council of Trent says the sacraments are not supposed to be obligations. Vatican II emphasizes that they're not supposed to be obligations. The council, And so the idea is that the sacraments are there to... Um, like tools in a tool belt that we're supposed to use when we need God's love in a more tangible manner. We do that on Sunday. We accept Jesus Christ in our lives uh, in the Mass. We do that um, in confession. We accept His grace and love in confession. We can accept God privately, um, but it's always more powerful to accept Him publicly. We can accept Him in whatever personal manner we want, but it's always more powerful to accept Him in a manner that was instituted by Christ. Um, so, you know, praise God that we can receive grace outside the sacraments, and praise God all the more that we can receive grace even more powerfully within the sacraments. God bless you guys. I know it's a busy exam week. I, I sincerely am praying for you. Uh, I wish you every success on every exam uh, and every test that's coming up. This should significantly help you with this last test of the quarter uh, before your exam next week. So this test is Wednesday. Unless you're out on Tuesday, you could take it on Thursday if you'd like. Um, and then the exam is the following Wednesday of next week, January 23rd. God bless you guys. I love you guys. Good luck with all your tests. You rock. Peace out.